The message I have been presenting for nearly 10 years never has been about me. Rather, it's about the subject matter. The subject matter was my focus for more than 20 years in classrooms. The subject matter is still my focus. The message is also about you, the, lo the learner interested in facts supported by evidence. The coordinated defamation campaign I have endured has been characterized by libel, slander, and, paradoxically, plagiarism. Defamation is the four-syllable word encompassing libel and slander. The cleverest of the defamers is David Wallace Wells. After a three-hour conversation via telephone while I was living in Belize, Wallace Wells wrote a long essay that he turned into his best-selling book, The Uninhabitable Earth. Shortly thereafter, he secured a contract with HBO Max for a fictionalized version of the story. The original magazine article was an epic work of plagiarism, with some passages taken word for word from our conversation. My name was never mentioned, nor that of my partner, who was also plagiarized. The final chapter of his book continued down the plagiaristic path, and then libeled me and my partner in the final chapter. I've not seen the HBO Max serial because I don't have the stomach to see more of my work turn into big money for somebody else. As an aside, nobody reading or viewing the information churned out by Wallace Wells seems to understand the word uninhabitable. If it's an uninhabitable earth, then it's not habitable. This concept is lost on the clueless masses. A man apparently named Mark Justin, who claims to be a spy contracted by the U.S. National Security Agency under the cover name Mark Austin, wrote to my friend Kevin Hester, who organized and hosted several of my speaking tours in New Zealand. Kevin received this message on December 19, 2016, quote, Thank you for hosting Guy McPherson. I'm afraid the NSA is about to get much tougher on him and a list of others, as Trump and Rex Tillerson have asked for specifics. Sorry. I'm only the messenger, end quote. The organized defamation campaign that effectively removed me from public service was completed within eight months. I was the first person, and apparently the test case, for the Me Too movement. I was accused of horrible things with women I never met. My public life was destroyed using tactics subsequently applied to Garrison Keillor and other innocent public figures. I'll provide a couple of examples from my own history. When I am invited to tour, or invited to be interviewed by a member of the corporate media, the person issuing the invitation has been contacted within two days by Derek Jensen, Mike Sleva, or other characters involved in the defamation campaign. This is not only recent history. It continues today. The person sending me the invitation has sent links to blog posts incorrectly claiming I am a terrible person. As a result, the invitation is immediately withdrawn. I have no idea how Jensen and others even know about the invitation, but they know essentially immediately after I receive an invitation. Within a day or two, the invitation to tour or submit to an interview is withdrawn. Bear in mind that I make no money off either touring or submitting to interviews. I tour in exchange for part of my expenses, and I submit to interviews for no charge at all. Example number two involves a romantic relationship with a woman for more than 35 years. We were married for nearly all of those 35 years. Obviously, she trusted me, as I trusted her. Yet, she turned immediately against me, preferring to believe the invented messages on Facebook. She probably didn't know, at the time, that the messages were invented. I didn't know this was even possible until about a year after my public life was ruined. As it turns out, commercial products are available to create Facebook messages between any people. As now seen at GuyMcPherson.com in an essay I wrote in response to the defamation campaign, someone made it appear that I messaged back and forth with President Donald Trump. Obviously, I added that message more than a year after my original essay was posted. My ex and many other people had no idea such deception was possible. I didn't know either. Now that I know, it's too late to use this knowledge. My public life has slipped away. My dad died believing I was guilty of terrible acts. The other members of my immediate family continue to believe this nonsense, which puts quite a strain on familial relations. Not only was the defamation campaign well-coordinated and sophisticated, it addressed every aspect of my life. I was blamed for three suicides, two of them conducted by acquaintances I never met. The first involved Michael C. Rupert, who was far too intelligent and knowledgeable to commit suicide based on anything I said or wrote. Yet, I was blamed for his suicide by a few public figures within a week after this suicide. 
The second case involved a depressed gay man living in Alabama to whom I spoke on the phone a few times. American writer Richard Heinberg somehow concluded I was responsible for the death of this man. Finally, I was blamed for the suicide of a dear friend who partner Pauline and I had agreed to house for a few weeks until he was able to move into a rental space a block away from where we were going to live. The notion that I would want this friend to die is absurd, of course. Apparently, those who defame me will employ any tactic along the way. Shortly after I wrote about the defamation campaign at GuyMcPherson.com, a renowned attorney reached out to me. Francis Gerald Maples is among the primary reasons you are not threatened by asbestos in businesses and homes. He and his legal team successfully sued the asbestos industry. Not long after his legal success with the asbestos industry, joined by a team of very talented attorneys, Gerald wrote and filed suit against more than 100 fossil fuel companies on September 20, 2005. The Comer versus Murphy Oil et al. lawsuit included about 100 oil, coal, chemical, and utility companies operating on a fossil fuel basis. In short, the companies sued were the largest emitters of greenhouse gases in the United States. Gerald Naples and others filed motions to dismiss, arguing that the suit was too complicated for judicial resolution. After extensive briefing and oral argument, the district judge granted dismissal because he wanted the fifth Circuit Court of Appeals to rule on the issue, which would avoid years of expensive litigation. The court ruled that the plaintiffs were to resume the case. The Fifth Circuit remanded to the district court for discovery and trial. Unfortunately, several justices on the United States Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals asked for rehearing in banc, meaning before the entire court of 16 judges. This was unfortunate only because after the judges entered the in banc hearing order, those very same judges recused themselves one at a time over a period of weeks such, there was, such that there was no longer a quorum to decide the case. However, in the order saying that the court did not have a quorum and consequently could not act, they did in fact act in ruling that the case was to be immediately dismissed. If this seems like a sneaky tactic to make sure the case was not heard, then you have reached the same conclusion as me. It gets worse. There are two federal statutes, either of which would have allowed for the creation of a quorum. The first statute would have allowed the Fifth Circuit to borrow circuit court judges from any of the other 11 circuit courts in the United States. The second statute would have allowed the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals to designate a district judge to sit as a circuit judge so that the case would have a quorum and the case could proceed. It is noteworthy that three Ivy League law review articles and case notes criticized the Fifth Circuit for failing to replace the recused judges so they would have a quorum and the case could proceed. This was the only such incident ever recorded in the United States jurisprudence. It effectively denied the plaintiffs an appeal. Despite those glaring legal errors, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to take the case for consideration of misconduct by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Undaunted, Gerald Maples found a savings statute, which, under Mississippi law, allowed a case that had been dismissed for purely technical or procedural issues could be refiled within one year of the dismissal of the initial suit. Consequently, Gerald then took advantage of the savings statute and filed an updated version of the complaint as a new lawsuit, known as Comer II. Predictably, the district court dismissed the case, completely ignoring the savings statute, so appeal was lodged to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit panel assigned to Comer II held a spirited hearing, but ultimately ruled that the case was not viable. It is clear that my friend Gerald was an amazing, dedicated attorney. I have no doubt that we were on the verge of using the American judicial system in my defense, beginning with the man who made a lot of money by plagiarizing and defaming me, David Wallace Wells. We would have continued our pursuit of justice with many other individuals, thus clearing my name and pointing out that climate change poses a serious existential threat to life on Earth. Sadly, Gerald slipped on a dock in the Bahamas and died in early December 2020. Not surprisingly, I have been unable to find another attorney willing to represent me on a pro bono basis. As one result, my ability to deliver the most important message in the history of our species has been lost. Billions of people will never know about our near-term demise. The evidence will remain hidden from view. 
The ultimate results will be large-scale confusion and chaos as the planet loses habitat for our species. Some people believe I just need to work harder and sacrifice more. I opted out of the monetary system once I realized it was driving us to extinction. That was May 1st, 2009, the day workers are celebrated throughout the world, except in the United States. I lived off-grid for a decade, first at the homestead I created in New Mexico, and later at the homestead created by my partner Pauline in Western Belize. During this time, I grew nearly all my own food. The few other people who have pursued this route within the last few decades know that it requires eating very little meat. The response? I'm attacked daily by vegans, a diet supported by raping the planet so that city dwellers living at the apex of industrial civilization can c consume soy and palm oil at the expense of the living planet. Even though I've not earned a paycheck since 2009, I continue to take responsibility for my own expenses. I pay for housing and food based on a job that paid reasonably well for two decades and frugal living afterward. In short, I've sacrificed more than the next few hundred people on the list of people making sacrifices, yet I am routinely accused of being supported financially by fossil fuel interests, that comes from Michael Mann, most notably, and my so-called rich girlfriend. Neither is true, obviously, I'm not supported by fossil fuel interests, or my so-called rich girlfriend, who's not rich. Through, through my life choices, I've sacrificed the ability to ever make money again at the job I love. I've sacrificed all my money and far too much of my time. I'm owed tens of thousands of dollars in personal loans to people who have made it clear they will not pay me back. In addition, please think about this. Do you believe Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, or Chelsea Manning will be able to make a comeback? I suspect the world's governments and media outlets will ensure there is no such comeback for them or for me. My message, rooted in love and evidence, is far more important than anything they have to say. I am left with the same impact I had during more than two decades on various university and college campuses. Very little. Nearly 8 billion people will never know about loss of habitat for our species and what that means for life on Earth. Beyond the expected sadness and continuation of my freely available work, there's nothing I can do. I have accepted that my impact is small and will remain that way. Adhering to the principles of modern Stoicism, accepting my limited role as a teacher, I will continue to try to reach the few, pe the few people cognitively and emotionally capable of accepting evidence and living accordingly. I will continue to live simply while striving to enjoy the abundant beauty surrounding my life. Again, this is not about me. This is about the freely available truth, underlain by the evidence I have been presenting for many years. Please join me in spreading this evidence. Perhaps we will make a positive difference for a few people. At this point, that's the best we can expect. Thank you for watching, liking, and subscribing to this channel. If you subscribe, please click the bell so that you will become notified about future videos. Feel free to share this video, become a member of this channel for additional perks at as little as 99 cents per month. Mostly, though, thanks for watching.